in advance, just in case sometimes it gets a little long to be able to wrap up in a little short of time. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me and allow me to present my paper, Comparation, Competition and Patterns, Understanding Innovation in the Telecommunications Sector. So, as many of you may know, standards are the base of many modern innovations. This is the case, for example, of the internet protocols, also the mobile networks, 3G, 4G, 5G. Very often, uh, those global standards are developed by the main firms in the industry. And this is especially the case when there are very strong network effects or the technology is very um, complicated and expensive to develop. But all those firms working together to develop technology triggers a conflict. On the one hand, standards are a kind of public good because all firms in the industry benefit from having the standard. For example, think about the new 5G, think about all the telecom operators that are gonna benefit from it or the mobile manufacturers. So to overcome the free riding problem that we all know that comes with the provision of public goods, <clears throat> firms that contribute to the development of these standards are allowed to keep their intellectual property rights individual. And there is where the conflict arises. On the one hand, we're gonna uh, we're gonna have the the public good component of the standards, but on the other hand, firms are gonna compete for this private component of the standard. So so uh, in, in my paper what I do I analyze this conflict and I particularly focus on how this conflict affects firms' incentive to cooperate in technology development. Particularly, I'm gonna be looking at who the firms want to collaborate with when there is this trade-off. In terms, of especially, I'm gonna look at uh, whether the other firms are kind of close in the technological spectrum or further. And by the technological spectrum, uh, I mean whether, let's say, knowledge or the abilities and secondly, I'm going to focus on the role of property rights in this conflict, because as I already mentioned, um, property rights are going to help to alleviate this free riding problem. But on the other hand, those are the ones introducing the private component part of the conflict. So how this is going to uh, operate in equilibrium, what's the overall effect, is something that I'm also going to look in my paper. And I'm going to study this particularly on the uh, um, on the development of um, different generations of mobile networks, 3G, 4G particularly, is going to be my empiric uh, case, but it also applies for 5G that is also developed the same way. Um, when are you going to do that? First, let me tell you that it's an ideal laboratory to see what I'm trying to look. First, because the network technology itself, the 5G, 4G, uh, are defined by standards, global standards that are uh, effectively uh, developed by the main firms in the industry, cooperatively. And secondly, because patents are uh, used to protect the intellectual property right of the technology that is, um, let's say, inside um, these 5G networks. And these patents are uh, kept by each firm's contributing to the development of the standards individually, not as a group. But also, let me add that the market itself is a very relevant market. In 2018, it already represents almost 5% of global GDP. And according to some estimation, it might, with the upcoming 5G, it might represent uh, something close to the 10% of the global GDP. We are talking about uh, a lot of money here. And finally, also, let me tell you that there is, a, uh, uh, there is an outgoing a policy and um, academic debate on the use of patent in these standardized technologies, especially the ones that have such a strong network. So before I can tell you a little more about how I'm gonna um, under, um, study in firms incentives, the raw property rights, and I don't know if I have the chart here. Oh yeah. No. Oh. So, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so before I can tell you a little more about how I'm going to probe the research question I tell you, let me tell you very briefly with a very simple example how uh, developing standards works in the telecommunications sector. So let's make it very simple. Imagine we want to develop 5G, and let's make it very simple. Let's. Uh, 
let's think that 5G has only two components. To have 5G, we need an antenna and we need a protocol to send some signals. So all the firms that are interested in developing 5G, the main firms in the industry, are going to come up with different ideas on how to build the antenna or the type of signal we want to send. And they're going to write, and this is uh, very important, they're going to write technical proposals. And they're going to come to this group and say, OK, I have this idea how to build antenna for 5G or how to send the signal. So firms can participate in, in the development of both components or only one. And, and this part is uh, also very important to understand is they're going to decide which is the technology that ultimately is going to be considered the 5G technology. But it's not only the firms showing up in, in, in this um, working group, the ones, uh, the antenna one, for example. It's going to be uh, the whole um, firms in the, um, in the um, in the, in, the, in the big group, sorry, in the standard setting organization that uh, there we can see that there are a lot of firms, for example, we are a lot of stakeholders like the government, uh, universities, uh, everybody who's interested in 5G can participate in this. I'm gonna talk about this um, organization and some slides uh, afterwards, but basically what I think what is very important is that it's not gonna be the two firms participating who are the ones, the ones deciding which technology is gonna be uh, finally included in 5G. So once we decide on the technology, standards are going to be draft. Standards are themselves documents that just tell you how to develop, how to implement the antenna or the signal. So once all the standards of all the components of the systems are draft or uh, finally written, we can send that 5G is re ready to implement. So what is going to happen? Well, people uh, who are going to use this technology, we can think, for example, about device manufacturers, Think about Apple that wants to launch the new iPhone and they want this uh, new iPhone to be able to connect to this new uh, 5G network, are going to use these standards, are going to look at this document, see how they have to make their phone compatible with that. <clears throat> and for using this technology, they're going to have to pay to the firms developing this technology. And this is the part I was um, mentioning at the beginning, the firms that um, develop the technology that has ultimately been included in 5G are going to get this intellectual property right individually. They're going to have patents protecting it. And therefore, they're going to be able to collect royalties for uh, when a, any manufacturer uh, is going to use that technology, is going to infringe any of those patents. And finally, um, after the devices are, um, are manufactured, uh, they're going to be uh, sold downstream. So some firms that may or might not uh, be the ones developing the technology are going to send these uh, mobile phones to final uh, consumers and get money out of it. So um, I know that even if it's simple, it can be a little complicated. What I would like you um, to keep in mind from, from this part is that, first of all, firms can benefit from two mechanisms if they decide to participate in the development of the standards. One is if they are the ones uh, developing the technology that has been ultimately be included in the standards, they might get royalties for this, or depending on their business model, if there are firms that are uh, selling devices that will be uh, mobile, but also we can talk about chips or different I don't know, telecommunication equipment, that can make some money in the downstream part of the market or in the intermediate part of the market. So in this paper, so coming back to my idea with this framework, now that we know a little bit how they're going to cooperate and where the competition might be for the ownership of these property rights, let me re uh, remind you what I wanted to study. Uh, I am, I'm going to have in this paper this novel data set on firm group on the development of 3G and 4G, and I'm going to develop a two-stage structural equilibrium model when I'm going to um, account for the effort decision and by effort. I'm going to be uh, talking about how many of these technical solutions they propose to each of the groups I told you before, to the antenna group and to the signal group, and if they decide at the first place to participate. And let me uh, now, yes, rephrase you my question. And just in case we run a little bit out of time, sometimes uh, my paper is a little bit long, I cannot reach properly the end. So let me tell you the previews of my results also. So with respect to the first question, that do firms have incentive to collaborate with firms that are closer or further in their technological spectrum when we have all this conflict between public good and private component in mind? Well, what I'm going to tell you is that um, it's going to depend. What I found 
if we account for technical similarity, this is this technological uh, dimension, uh, how much uh, effort they're gonna provide. And um, by effort, again, I'm gonna be talking all the time about how many contributions they're gonna do to each of the groups they decide to participate. What I find is an inverted U shape. And basically this inverted U shape is uh, the combination of two forces. On the one hand, when firms are very similar, meaning that they specialize in the same area, what I'm gonna see is that there is a lot of competition for the uh, ownership of this intellectual property right. This competition is very tough. They cannot appropriate as much as they would like from this private part, this private component, and therefore they don't have so many incentives uh, to put effort. But on the other hand, I'm also gonna show you, hopefully convince you that uh, in this game, there are not many uh, gains from comparison when firms are very different. You might think, for example, um, in co-authorships, right? When we write a paper, sometimes you want to write a paper with someone who's not cycling your field. But sometimes if I put someone who writes a theory, micro theory, to work with a guy that works in empirical macro, it might be very hard for them to find maybe gains in that cooperation. And that's a little bit of the spirit of why we might not see uh, big gains from cooperation when firms from very different um, very far away in the technological spectrum decide to work together to develop these standards. And the second uh, question of my paper is what is the effect of patent licensing on the development of the standard? How this uh, shapes cooperation in this setup? So as I already told you, um, allowing firms to uh, get privately the um, their intellectual property rights of their technology helps to alleviate the free, ride, uh, free riding problem of working in teams. So it's gonna be uh, an incentive to increase effort. But on the other hand, it might distort firms' uh, effort allocation in the sense that now that we know that firms, um, there are not much gains from working with different firms, but on the same time, if I work with very similar firms, I might have uh, the gains are bigger, but I'm gonna compete more for this private component. This might generate a distortion when I choose in which uh, of, the, of the components to work on. And uh, I'm gonna see which is the overall effect of these uh, two forces. Uh, and in fact, what happens if we would allow, or would force more than allow firms um, to license their patents for free what will be the implications in terms of cooperation in this setup. And for that, I'm gonna uh, conduct a counterfactual analysis where I'm gonna, do, uh, gonna look exactly at that. And what I'm gonna find is that um, whenever we force firms to license our patents for free, we're gonna see an increase in the standardization time. On my model, let me uh, spoil a little bit, it's gonna be about time. That is, uh, I don't have any um, other way to measure economically which is the value of this um, team product. So what I'm gonna see is how, how long they take to develop. And what I see is that if we don't allow firms to um, uh, license their patents for money, uh, what we see is that the, a lot of firms are not gonna participate. There is a decrease in participation around 7%, but also the ones that participate are gonna exert less effort around 80%. Despite that, we're going to see that there is a reallocation of firm effort and they're going to work with more similar firms. That is something we like in this model because gains from cooperation are bigger. But this is not uh, going to be enough um, uh, to compensate uh, the drop in participation and effort. And that's why we see this increase in the standardization time. Uh, in terms of numbers, well, this, gonna, uh, this um, will imply a um, delay of one year in the development of the first version of 4G, where you're gonna see that uh, generations are gonna have different releases, but the first one is gonna, uh, would, would have uh, been developed one year later. And even if my model is all about time, let me give you an idea of how much money we're talking about. To, to give you some numbers in your mind, one year, the first year, uh, 4G was launched, the first version. Royalties uh, were about 13,500 million. And what's more important, or it means even more money, the third generation of smartphones that can totally be linked to the third generation of 4G were around a little less than $300 million, which is uh, quite a lot. So um, give, let me give you a little perspective where my paper fits in the literature. So I think the first trend uh, I'm contributing is the one of standardization and patents. There is a lot of theoretical literature on that. 
we have a very um, seminal paper on learning how to draw, how farm shoes, which is standardization body to, uh, to join, and some other more related to the patterns and royalties in patterns like Shevet and Padisha. Uh, and then in the empirical part, we have some uh, work done by Riesman and Zinko on standards. They mostly look at standards in the internet protocols and some cases study uh, also by uh, Baker et al. In terms of how cooperation and competition happen in standardization and how it is related to the similarity in the technological spectrum, we have uh, some um, empirical work done by Baron and Polman and Maretal where they, they, they find that the firms uh, working together are more similar than they would have expected. And finally, in terms of cooperation and competition in teams, most of this literature is theoretical. And um, a lot of the most modern literature on that is about networks. And we have a, in the empirical part, a paper that talks about co-authorship that emphasizes cooperation, but doesn't include competition uh, itself. So the contributions uh, of my paper, um, Hopefully, this is, uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, this is the first structural model on standardization in the telecommunication sector. And I'm going to count for both margins, uh, participation and decision, the intensive and the extensive margin. I'm going to also come up with some empirical measures of cooperation and competition that are a little new in this market. And I'm going to be able to provide some contrafactual evidence uh, of what happened when we change licensing rules. So the presentation is going to go as follows. I'm going to give you uh, some um, very um, quick information on institutional background uh, and the data I'm going to use. Then I'm going to show you some reduced form um, motivating evidence. Then I'm going to introduce you to the empirical model, uh, how I estimate it and identify the main parameters, and then the estimates and my contrafactual plots. So let's start by uh, telling you a little bit more about this standard setting organizations. So the standard setting organizations, uh, the, the one in charge of providing the standard for the telecommunication sector is uh, called the third generation publishing program. And what is important about this organization is that it's open, subject to a fee, <clears throat> and that the standards are global. The same standards are gonna be used here uh, in Uruguay as gonna be used in Europe and as in the US. Um, and uh, which is also key to understand here that technology is gonna be chosen by consensus. Um, by consensus, I mean not only the firms developing the technology, but all the organizations that are going to be part of this, uh, this standard setting organization. And we're talking here about a uh, hundred, hundred of firms. And um, let me tell you that consensus uh, means 100% of agreement at the first round, but can mean 70% depending on how many rounds uh, this um, can take to achieve consensus. And the other thing I think it's really important um, and in order to understand uh, what I'm going to tell you today, is that one of the goals of this organization itself, and this is taken from, from one of, of their documents, is to use the minimum production time for technical speci specifications and technical reports from, from conception to approval. Technical specialization is the name they give to standards, basically, in, in, my, in, my, in my setup. And the whole point is that time matters and uh, providing standards in time is something that it's a goal itself for the organization. And finally, in this organization, they also set some rules for the licensing. Currently, uh, they have this uh, friend, this fair and reasonable and discriminatory rules. But basically, if you participate in this, uh, you agree to license your patents in these terms. I'm not gonna talk much about this because there is, is not the main uh, thing on my paper. But it's important in order to keep it in mind when it comes to contrafactual that nowadays it's not that they can charge whatever money they want uh, for the patents anyway. So um, something about how this market works, we all know it's 6, 3G, 4G, and now something coming that's 5G. But even inside these generations, we have different versions of the technology that are called releases. So the standard itself is going to be the document that describes one component. In my very simple example at the beginning was the antenna or the signal. Then we're going to have a, a release that is kind of a version. And then when the versions are very different, we jump into a new generation. And I explain this because I'm going to play with the variation between release and generations in uh, the empirical part in order to have identification of some of the parameters I want to look at. And then about the market, um, I'm going to uh, divide, um, I'm, we're going to have a different strands of the market. 
we're going to have some firms that are going to, I'm going to call them a pure app soon, that are the firms that only are going to develop technology, if you remember uh, at my first scheme. And uh, uh, these firms are only going to get money from licensing. They're only going to have uh, that uh, mechanism. And an uh, example of that in this market is interdigital. Then they're going to come the ones that are vertical integrated. And by that, I'm going to be the ones that are going to uh, produce or develop some technology, but also I'm going to sell something. It can be um, uh, downstream, like phones. And they're going to have this, so these two sources of revenues, and that's the important part. Yes. For the for the, the model itself and an uh, example of this is samsung for example now we're going to have what i call the intermediary firms that are very similar to the vertical integrated in the sense that they're going to develop technology upstream but they're not going to sell something uh, to final consumers but uh, maybe to other producers it can be chips it can be equipment and um, the thing is that they're also going to have these uh, two sources of revenues and i think the uh, very clear example of this one is qualcomm and finally, we're going to have operators that are going to be only downstream. Most of them are not going to develop any technology. Uh, and basically, they're going to charge us for telecom services. And the example of this is Vodafone. Finally, when I'm going to be referring to patents, all the time I'm going to be really talking about the standard issue patents. And those patents are the ones that are, are essential in order to implement the standard. And those are the ones that uh, have to be licensed in the front uh, terms. And finally, firms are going to have going to be heterogeneous uh, in two dimensions. They're going to have this what I'm going to call technological knowledge. And this is going to refer to the specialization, right? In these firms are specialized, for example, in developing antennas or developing signals. And on the other hand, they're going to be heterogeneous on their business model. And by business model, I mean one of these four categories. If they're only going to be uh, upstream firms, vertically integrated uh, intermediaries or operators. Both of these things are going to be exogenous. I'm just going to take whatever I see on the data. And these uh, firms are not going to uh, change uh, their nature in my paper. So um, the data I use. So, to do this an, an analysis, I use four uh, sources of information. The first one, I think, and the most novel one is a standardization one from the, uh, the SEAL Center of Northwestern University. And this gives me access to information on which are the firms participating, which is standard uh, they are developing, how many of these contributions that I was talking at the beginning, how many of these written documents they provide to each of these groups. Um, then uh, I also going to have uh, information on who are the holders sort of the intellectual property right that finally has been included in the standard. And this is going to give me the measure of participation, effort, development time. Also, it, it tells me how long it takes and the patents. Uh, also, I'm going to add some data from the standardization organization website, so from 3GPP. Basically, um, what I'm going to have is information that uh, on the number of technology goals of each standards uh, that somehow what it's going to give me is how important because or not as you can imagine not all components are equally important in developing 5G. Maybe it's not uh, the antenna is way more important than the signal in our example. So uh, with, with this I'm going to be able to create a measure of the heterogeneity in the broadness or the importance of the standard or the complexity, which is going to allow me to control for that in my empirical part. Then I'm going to use some data on patents from the USPTO. And I'm going to use for each firm participating uh, in this, um, in the development of the technology, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the patents uh, these firms have, their patent portfolio. And something that's really good about patents, maybe here everybody knows it, but that patents have a classification itself. So I can know if this patent is related to antennas, for example, or to signal. So with that, I'm going to be able to somehow measure in where, which part of the technological spectrum is each firm is specialized prior to join the development of this technology. And uh, finally, uh, I add some other information on campus that about um, firm's characteristics, like size, employee sales, and uh, I describe on the firm's web page to have the to be able to classify them in the upstream, uh, downstream part of the market or vertical integration. So some um, empirical definitions. Um, so a group here um, is going to be uh, the, all the firms contributing to a standard. And a technical, technical specification uh, is going to be the standard that's going to come, remember, with a version, even inside each of the generations. 
as a proxy of effort, what I'm going to use is these documents that firms have to provide to the group that are participating to develop the antenna, right, for example. I'm going to be able to count the number of documents they submit. Uh, to have an idea, I have a, a little less than 2,000 standards. There are nine versions of them from 2003 to 2012 and six, 645 specifications in each of the documents. I'm going to be working with 35 firms. This is the top 15 um, uh, firms that overall are working and represent 83% of the total contributions that have been submitted to the group. Uh, to have an idea per standard per group, we're going to have uh, uh, on average 6.1 firms participating with a maximum of 25 in a very, very big group. And each firm on average participate uh, in 63 uh, different groups per version of the standard. So um, uh, about the technological spectrum and the technological characterization of the firms, um, let me go a little bit um, quicker on this one. So I, I think I'm running a bit late. So basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at the patent. Uh, I'm gonna contract the patent portfolio, see each patent to which category they belong using the international patent classification, and then uh, sum the number of patents in each classification. Then I'm gonna have, um, some vectors. So in order to see how similar these vectors are, what I'm going to do is the cosine between this vector, the cosine similarity. Basically, if this is zero, it means that they're, they're all the patterns they have is in totally different categories, so they have nothing in common. And one means that they're specialized exactly in the same areas. The good thing about using this is that give me an idea of similarity respectively of size, and then I can control for size separate. Um, um, Okay, about the, um, the output of the group. As I told you at the beginning, I have uh, no um, economic valuation of how much each standard values, but what I have is how long it takes a group to develop a standard. And as I mentioned before, this is important for the organization. One of the goals is to uh, develop a standards in due time. So I'm gonna assume that the value of a standard is somehow a function of the time it takes to develop and that all firms want to develop uh, the standard as um, in less in the, in the less possible time, right? Um, and about firms revenue, um, firms are gonna have, depending on their business model, they can make money out of royalties or out of selling um, uh, goods downstream. And um, basically the problem I'm gonna have is that the licensing and revenues are not observed, it's something very common. Uh, so somehow I'm going to assume they're going to be proportional to the number of patents, and I'm going to use my structural model to work out some of the parameters referring to licensing and to see how important licensing is for these firms in terms of incentive. So let me show you some um, evidence of all these ideas I have been talking about to see if it makes any sense in the data. So the first thing I did is, is I, I plugged uh, the similarity of the firms, I just discretized by design. Uh, this item uh, are the 10% more similar firms, once the most the different one, and the number of contributions they do um, per uh, the average per the style of each of these uh, bits, right? And what we can see here is this type of inverted U shade I was uh, telling you at the beginning. Um, what I'm going to show you is that uh, this. Um, this downstream part of the inverted U shape is going to be uh, of it's going to be because of this competition effect that because more similar firms are going to get less patents and therefore they're going to have less incentives to put effort. But I'm also going to show you that when they're very different, uh, there are not much gains from corporations. It's going to take a lot. Of, it's going to take longer to develop, or let's say the complementarities are um, smaller. And therefore, they also don't have much uh, incentives um, to provide effort. So about these two effects I was telling you, this is the competition effect, what I did here. Um, and you can see in the paper um, some reduced forms uh, after this graph is this is the more similar firms. And you can see how many patterns they claim to have in each of the standards they are participating in each of the components. And you can see that the more similar the firms are in the group, the less patents the, they're claiming, the more the less essential patents they claim to have on this group. Uh, well, this is about the share. And uh, also you can see some very used form where you can see that definitely using um, patents as a dependent variable, the more similar the firms, the less uh, patents they claim to get. 
and, and about the cooperation effect, the other part of the um, inverted U shape. Uh, in order to see which are the complementarities of working with similar firms, what I did is I specified this time production function of time to develop <coughs> and how I call the main variable. And basically the main inputs here to develop a standard are these formal contributions, this document. So what I did uh, is um, this, um, this uh, time to develop function. And in order to account for the complementarities, uh, I allow for the interaction of the contributions of firms from different specializations. And what I did is I discretize how similar these firms are in this case, I'll contact, you can see also this size and see if this fee, uh, this fee parameter uh, changes when firms are more similar, if these complementarities are uh, greater or smaller. And what I find is that the more similar the firms, the greater are the complementarities. Therefore, when I work with, and if we go to the first side, if I work with very similar firms, this component in zeros is basically the same thing that if we work separately. And that's the intuition behind the left part of the inverted U shape. So um, why do I need a model? Well, a structural model will allow me first to endogenize participation. That is uh, another key element in, in this analysis uh, before uh, taking the decisions. Also to separate cooperation and competition effect properly and back out some revenues, uh, parameters and quantify licensing importance, which is really um, interesting in this um, context, since we don't know much about how this, how much money these firms make out of the licensing of these patents. And finally, it's going to allow me also to measure uh, which will be the effect of changing some licensing rules in the time to develop these standards. Basically, uh, this kind of factual policy I was talking about the free license. So let me tell you a sketch of the model. It's going to be a two-stage equilibrium model with complete information so far. Uh, firms are going to decide uh, in which standard they want to participate in this group. If you remember, they're going to decide where to participate in antenna or in the signal or in both in our very simplified um, uh, example. And they're going to decide this based on the thing. One of the things they're going to consider is the technological match between them and the group. And what do I mean by that? Well, if I'm a firm that I'm specialized in antennas, and you can see that because you can see the patterns I already got, uh, already have before joining uh, this process, it's more likely that I'm gonna join an antenna group. And this is what I call the technological match, how similar uh, this, um, or how, how good is the fit between what I already did and what the uh, group needs. So, uh, and this is gonna be modeled as a fixed cost of participation, right? And then the other thing they're going to count is the potential profit they can get. And those potential profit, as I already mentioned, they're going to depend the, on the business model of the firm and the potential to get uh, royalties out of the intellectual property right uh, they, of the technology they already developed. So, um, the, okay, so this is going to be the, the first uh, decision if they want to participate or not. And once they decide if they want to participate, how much effort to exert. Our uh, firms are going to decide effort uh, to provide in each of the components by a standard. And as I already um, show you in the um, empirical evidence, this effort, these contributions are going to be the main input in the time to develop the standard, which is uh, um, the goal of the group. So firms are going to choose the effort and maximize their respected profits. And for that, I'm going to construct a respected profit function. And I'm going to do, uh, as usual, the by backward dash. So let's start in the second uh, stage. Firms already decide, have already decided to participate. Now they need to know how many of these contributions they're going to provide to the group. And they're going to do it uh, according um, to the maximization of their respected uh, profits. So um, uh, for that, I, construction this, I constructed this function where this first term here basically is, we can think about it as a group output. And it's going to be a function of the time to develop. I'm, uh, I choose uh, this linear way of introducing it to the benefit function. This is uh, not going to change the result. It's just going to make it way more easy to solve at this stage, which is going to be very valuable when it comes to the estimation of the model, because I'm going to estimate it by simulations. Uh, but basically, what we want, uh, the idea is that the value of the group, the, of the output of the group, depends negatively on the time it takes to develop, right? We want this to be developed as fast as possible. And the way to speed up things in this model is gonna be by providing more of these contributions, more of this effort. So effort is gonna be an endogenous object that 
is going to be chosen by firms at this stage and it's going to allow to have a, a bigger pie if you want to think about it. Uh, so this is the first the, the first part of this uh, profit function. And the second part is how much of this pie I can appropriate for myself, right? And as I tell you, there are going to be two main mechanisms. One is going to be, it's going to depend on the downstream profits I can get. And this is going to depend on the business model. If I um, think about these very big firms, multi-products, some of them, Samsung, uh, Apple, Qualcomm, and this is going to be exogenous, right? I, I'm not going to change what I'm selling downstream because I participate in this group or not. So this is going to be exogenous and just um, uh, consider that it's going to well vary at that level, at this business model level. And the second part of the expected profits is how much I can get out of the licensing of the patents. Remember, and this, yes, it's going to be an endogenous object. The number of patents I can, I'm going to be able to get or I expect to get is going to depend in the group I choose to participate and on one of the characteristics that are going to um, um, that are gonna make this change is how similar are the other firms in the group, right? This competition effect is gonna show here. This is an endogenous object. I'm gonna show you in the next slide uh, the function for that. And finally, I'm gonna allow uh, for a marginal cost of providing effort. Adiana, uh, less than five minutes left. Okay, cool. <laughs> okay, let, let me move. So you can the, take a couple, a couple of minutes more if you want to. Oh, thank yeah. you. Yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. So uh, most of these equations have already, I already showed it in the empirical uh, part, this time to develop that this is object here, the, say the group output, it just gonna be this production function where effort is the main output and I'm gonna allow for the interaction of efforts to measures complementarity. And one more time, P is our via our cooperation uh, parameter, right? And we're gonna allow them to change with similarity. And then the other uh, endogenous objects were the number of patents a uh, firm can expect to get if they decide to participate. And this is going to be uh, just a linear function on firm's characteristics of the other participant characteristics, but very important on how similar are the firms that decide to participate. Remember, we're already at stage two, we already know who's in there. So this uh, C parameter is going to measure the competition, right? The competition parameter. And <clears throat> If things are as we expected, we're going to have this positive uh, free cooperation and this negative co competition parameter. And um, so um, to get from the optimal effort, I just solve for the model, the first order equation. And something that is really nice about this model is that it is all linear and it can be solved just by inverting the matrices, which uh, it's really good and saves a lot of time. So, and also, um, I can show that the equilibrium at this stage is going to be unique. So now we move to the first um, decision. It's about participation, right? So firms are going to participate if their expected profit of participate are greater than uh, the ones of not participating. And I think here uh, what is important is to see which are the profits in each of the scenarios. If we participate, this effort is going to be a given effort and usually it's going to be uh, higher, but also the effort of other firms is going to change if I participate or not. And the um, group output is going to change this time. The revenues, if I participate, I'm going to be able to get it uh, from downstream part, depending on my business model and licensing. But if I don't participate, the contrafactual scenario would be that the time it's going to take to develop is going to be different. Not only because I'm not going to provide any effort, but also the firms uh, working with me are going to provide a different amount of effort. And also, I'm going to be shutting down one of the channels I can benefit from. If I don't participate in my model, I don't allow them to benefit from licensing any patent. So with this in mind, I'm gonna uh, write um, a logic equation. Um, oh, sorry, um, I forgot to mention the fixed cost part I told you at the beginning. I'm gonna, I'm gonna model this match between what the firms know and what the standard needs as a function um, of uh, this, um, well, of different characteristics. And I'm gonna introduce this as a fixed cost of participation. What I want basically is that if uh, I'm very close to whatever the group needs, it's more likely that I participate that if it's the opposite. And then I still am gonna uh, write a logic model. So I'm gonna have um, different parameters uh, to identify and estimate. Basically, we're gonna have the ones of the time production function, the one of the patent function, then the revenue parameters that are also very important uh, to my understanding because it's gonna give us, uh, gonna shed some light on the importance of licensing the marginal cost and the participation parameters. 
And my estimation strategy is going to be, uh, I'm going to rely on three stages. First, I'm going to estimate the ones of the time to develop and the patent um, equation, just uh, with standard uh, within group approach. That's very simple. Tatiana, Tatiana, maybe you can go directly to the results. Sorry. Uh, yes. So what I'm, finally, what I'm going to find is that we have that this um, we have this positive uh, cooperation effect and um, this negative competition effect, meaning that the more similar the firms are, the 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 more uh, they can profit from cooperation, but the more they're going to compete for the intellectual property right. This is how the model fits. And another part that uh, I really like to show is uh, how important licensing is. And for that, I construct this index that is the licensing revenues. But basically, what I'm trying to measure is how important is licensing respect to the total revenues. Remember that I don't have much of a scale. My model is identified up to a scale factor. So um, what I can do is this type of, of comparison. And basically, what I found is that licensing is way more important in 4G than in 5G in 3G for firms. And uh, the change is very important, especially uh, for intermediary firms that basically before they were playing much more of a side role. And um, as, a, as a check, as a validity check of my model, uh, I took some data uh, from financial reports. And basically I took one of the company Qualcomm that uh, it's very nice because they, in their in financial report, they separate what the money, the revenues they get from licensing from what they get from selling chips. So I was able to reconstruct this licensing index for them. I, what I can tell you is that um, in my model, uh, what I found is that this licensing for Qualcomm was around 60 or 60, between 60%. And uh, when I go to the data to their financial report, I found it's between 60 and 70%, which at least is in the same order of magnitude. And then I do some other checks with the literature, which I also find uh, pretty much in line with my results. And finally, uh, let me uh, go to the contrafactual policy. Basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to shut down this uh, uh, channel, this revenue channel. Uh, and basically, what I'm going to find is that there's going to be a slowdown in the standard development, basically because we're going to see um, a decrease in participation and a decrease on the effort. Even though we're going to see that firms are going to collaborate in this counterfactual scenario with more similar firms, and therefore the gains for, from cooperation are bigger. But this is not going to be uh, enough to. Um, uh, overcome the drop on the other um, on participation and effort. So finally, hopefully in this paper, I show you a little bit uh, uh, the incentives are have when they decide to collaborate uh, in the development of uh, a common technology, the role played by cooperation and on competition, and very important, the, uh, the role played by intellectual property rights that at the end of the day, we have to be very careful if we want to regulate on that because it is a really important incentive for I think one of the main message I would like to give you is that it's a very important incentive for firms that are participating, even though there are big firms are also selling downstream, we can see that the slowdown of one year is uh, very relevant in our context. So that's it, sorry for the minutes I took. Thanks a lot, Tatiana. So now Emanuele can take over. If you